what's up? So this is the Day by Day podcast. My name is Dakota Day. This is my brother Ryan Day. What's up, Ryan? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Man, we I'm have excited. an interesting subject that we're yes. going to be looking at today, and that is youth and why youth are leaving the church. Mm-hmm. Um, this is a this is a interesting topic. This is a mm-hmm. very sensitive topic to some, but it's also a very deep topic. And so I, t- earlier, about a few hours ago, we knew we were going to be doing this podcast. I made a Facebook post, okay, and I tagged you in it, and I basically simply asked the question. The question was simple. Why do you guys think the youth is leaving church today? And what do you believe is the solution to this issue? Mm-hmm. And so we got a lot of comments right. right off the bat. In fact, I'm just going to look at the comments so far. This was I posted this two hours ago. And just within two hours, we've gotten 67 comments, okay. which is pretty good. And that gave us a lot, of course, to kind of go off to see what people are thinking. But we also have our own experiences Mm -hmm. we're going to be talking about and going through this. Um, So right off the bat, let's just jump into this. Okay. This this seems to be a bit of a pandemic of why what what we've been seeing in our years being in in church, not just in 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 denominational churches. This seems to be a pandemic that's happening all over the church. In Mm -hmm. fact, uh, the last like I think it's like last six months. I've seen probably three to four uh, articles that um, Apple News had put out regarding right. youth, young adults leaving the church, and l- young adults cutting off their parents, leaving their parents, leaving their homes, and not wanting anything to do with them. Right. There's there, there seems to be a connection between their experience at church and their experience at home, and there's just a lot that we got to unpack from this. So, right off the bat. What's the first thing that comes to your mind when we talk about why is the youth leaving the church? What's the first thing that comes to your mind? Well, I want to just I want to put it out there as a as kind of an umbrella. Okay. And then I think under this umbrella falls a lot of spider webbed issues. I would agree. And I don't think it's just one single issue for every single person. Okay. We're all different. We all have different reasons of why we might be affected within the church negatively that might cause us to make the decision to pull away or to leave the church as we're seeing this, as this is our conversation. Yeah. Um, but you know, Dakota, before we get started, I feel led, as always, let's go ahead and have a prayer about this, because before we jump into this conversation... Um, we, 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 I, we usually <laughs> pray before, and I forget we need to pray no, absolutely. for that, the audience as well. So yeah, we, let's, let's have a word We're very passionate about this topic, and we need the Holy Spirit to lead us. So let's pray. Father in heaven, um, God, I just simply ask for your Holy Spirit to lean down to to reach your hand down to to fill this room with your spirit fill us with your spirit Lord clothe us in your love give us your wisdom and knowledge on this subject we know that we don't have all the answers God but we know you do and um, but Lord this is a subject that needs to be discussed we've let it go for too long and I think that maybe there's a little bit of fear maybe there's a little bit of anxiety maybe we just feel uh, you know, unknowledgeable about this subject that we just remain silent on it. But again, everyone has an opinion as to why we're in this predicament. So, Father, I just want you to lead and guide us in our conversation. We do want to highlight some things that we feel that we've observed, that we've we've noticed is happening, that we've heard and experienced. But at the same time, Lord, we also want to bring about solutions. We don't just want to talk about the negativities. We want the solutions as well. So we give this time to you. We ask your Holy Spirit to lead us, and we ask that your will be done in Jesus' holy name. Amen. 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 All right, so uh, if I'm, jo- I'm going to just put this out there, as a blanket statement, I'm, I, I believe ultimately every all of, all of the issues that we're seeing mm-hmm. and that we're going to discuss and that people have an opinion about yeah. in regards to this subject, I believe it really stems from a lack of Christ within the equation in some scenario, okay. and therefore a lack of love. Gotcha. When Christ is not involved either in the person's heart that's leaving or in the person's experience that's leaving, or when Christ is not involved or uh, in the experience of those that might be causing Mm. the person to be offended or to be hurt or to be affected negatively to the point that they make the decision to leave. I think that ultimately there's a lack of love there. And when when love is not present, it leads to all of these other individual little 
issues, and I'm, I'm, I don't want to play that down and calling it a little issue because they're not little issues, they're huge issues, but, but, but it's kind of like a spider web. You have the main issue, mm. which is the lack of Christ, the lack of love, but then out of that, oh, by the way, I just did this. <laughs> and I'm going to, I'm going to get, all right, I just noticed this. I'm a little bit, it's actually, this right here is totally, uh, I'm not Illuminati and I'm not masonry or, or, <laughs> or any type of satanic, but I, I, I tend to have a, a habit where I sometimes get so much hey, into yeah, my, yeah, and yeah, I end yeah. up you doing just this. Talk with your hands, I'm going to have someone to like take a shot of this right here and go, yeah. Oh, Randy, Illuminati. Screenshot it. <laughs> satanic, you know. It's going Please right on Facebook. Help me! It's just a bad habit that I got to get away from. But anyways, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I caught my. I did that in a sermon one time at with uh, three ABN, and the comments were flooded with satanic, you know, hand symbols and all this stuff. And it's like, bro, I wouldn't know the first thing. I wouldn't know the. I wouldn't know. The, I wouldn't know the first person to people, contact yeah. to get involved in Illuminati or to get involved in Masonry or yeah. any of that. You know, secret society mess. I've but anyways, had people say the same thing. I, I didn't mean to, to get off subject there, but I saw myself doing that and I thought, oh, I better stop. Anyways, um, it's, I know it's completely silly, but uh, but yeah, the, the central issue I think is a lack of Christ in the equation and therefore a lack of love. And out yeah. from that webs all of these issues that lead individuals, depending on whatever it is they're dealing with, yeah. uh, it leads them to have this negative feeling, this negative perception, and ultimately it leads them to say, you know what, I don't, <clears throat> uh, this is... This is toxic, or yeah. this is there's I have a problem with this, or I feel un, unwanted, or there's just something here that's that's totally not for me. I need to, I need to leave. This sure. isn't good for me, or I'm getting nothing out of this. I need to leave. And so it could be on one person or the other's issue, or it could be a, a mixture of both. Sure. Uh, but we're going to talk about a lot of these issues. Yeah. yeah well, you know, initially uh, when I made this post, I wanted to just genuinely see what what do other people think. Because mm -hmm. I know me and you have had our own personal experiences, which is similar to a lot of degree because we've, you know, we've been to a lot of the same churches. We've, we've, we've experienced a lot of the same um, church dynamic and, right. and the, 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 the spectrum, the wide spectrum of, you know, you have every church, what, don't matter what denomination it is, you have liberals, what's titled as liberals mm -hmm. that represent that that group of people. And then you have a, a more conservative group. And then you have a third group that is just trying to follow the Bible, trying to do the best that they can. And they're not necessarily trying to put themselves in one or two camps. And I think that, you know, based on what I what I've seen a lot of people respond is that they have seemed to have gotten caught up in one or two camps. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you have today, for instance, the Democrats and the Republicans on the political spectrum, right? And and to some people, if you are a Democrat or you are a Republican, you immediately have aligned yourself with a whole set of beliefs or a whole set of, you know, um, uh, lifestyle values that, will, well, then you will be tagged or labeled as, right? Mm -hmm. And the same goes if you tell someone, well, I'm not really into politics, I'm nonpartisan. Mm-hmm. Then they'll lose. Then both sides sometimes lose their mind on you because you haven't picked a party that they think you should have picked. That it, you know that, that they're a part of. Mm -hmm. And I think as you as you get into this subject of why is the youth leaving the church? I think we all have had different experiences. Some of us have been yeah. caught up in legalistic camps. And for those of you that don't know what I'm talking about, you say legalistic camp. What is that? Well, legalistic camps are those camps that we. We, we get involved in these are people that are focused more on works, focused more on what you do, mm -hmm. and they're very proud about what they do and what they don't do. Behavior. Behavior. It's they're, behavior they're all behavior uh, focused. Focused, yeah. And that if you don't do this or do that, then you're not a real Christian. Or if you're struggling to do this or do that, or not do this and not do that, then you're not a real Christian. Right. And they'll label you. And then you have... The opposite groups, right, and, and, and more of the liberalism. So you have legalism and liberalism. And and um, I, I've I've said this everywhere I go. There's the narrow path that Jesus said in Matthew chapter seven that leads into life, but there's two ditches on both sides of the narrow path. There's mm -hmm. legalism, and then there's liberalism. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to be caught in either one of those camps mm. because legalism will take you down a path of complete despair at the end of the day because you will never be able to behave good enough. And then liberalism does the opposite. You kind of get the don't cares with liberalism, and you fall into this, you know, kind of once saved, always saved mindset where, you know, I've professed Jesus, praise the Lord, but 
I, I, I'm not really living that Christian life, but because I profess to him, I'm okay, and I can do whatever I want, live however I want. Mm. And we know that both of those camps are not biblically based, right? They're not, they're not balanced. Mm-hmm. And there's some truth in both camps, mm-hmm. but there's, I think there's a balance that we have to have as Christians so that we don't fall in either one of those ditches, and we can stay on that narrow path, which leads into life. Right. So, yeah, I, when, when, I, when I made this post, I immediately started seeing some people talking about legalism, works approach, behavior focus, like you said, mm-hmm. and other people were saying, you know, kind of insinuating the opposite. It's, it's that we're not preaching the straight message enough. We're not preaching the straight truth enough. Preach it. We're not making it clear. Tell them. And so it... it They're the problem. Yeah. <laughs> They're in the world. And, and there's they don't a, know their sin. And there's a lot, and, and I think you would agree, there's a lot of political worldly standards that have crept into many of the churches and that start to usurp or even take superiority in the minds and hearts of a lot of people that's in leadership of some of these mm-hmm. churches. And they create a political environment that's like, you're with us, right? Or you're against us. Mm-hmm. Instead of kind of realizing that we all have had different experiences— we all have been in different camps. We've all come from different directions. And um, I used to say that, you know, um, bro- that brother's on another level or whatever. And, 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 and one brother, can, uh, he, he corrected me one day. and He said, I was at Chili's sitting down eating with him. He was a guy that came to my evangelistic meetings. His name was Greg. And um, he said, you know, he said, don't, don't use that. He said, because then it makes you sound like one person's better than the other. And I was like, oh, yeah, I never thought about that before. And he goes, you know what I like to say? I said, what's that? He goes, we're all in different neighborhoods. Mm. And I like that. I thought, that's pretty good because, yeah, we we all have experienced different things in life, but that doesn't mean, in saying it that way, it doesn't mean that one person's better than the other. Right. So we all are in different neighborhoods. We all have mm-hmm. experienced things that other people haven't experienced. And But I think if we talk about these things, mm-hmm. people will be able to relate to us and say, okay, I can relate to Ryan and his experience. I can relate to Dakota and his experience. And we're praying that, People watching this will be able to share some of their stories, share some of their Absolutely. testimonies, and let's just make this of why the youth and why they see people leaving the church, specifically the youth, because there's a mass exodus. It seems it's mm-hmm. happening. And um, tell 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 me what you 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 talked about. You did a sermon mm-hmm. not too long ago. You preached and you you did this sermon, and I believe it was called it was a genius title, Euthanasia. Mm-hmm. T- tell us about that. Why did you title it Euthanasia? And what was what was the what was the purpose that you saw personally that made you say, "Let me do this sermon"? Well, as you know this more than anyone, as an mm-hmm. evangelist, we have the wonderful privilege of being able to travel mm-hmm. and go yep. into different states within the United States. Most of our meetings are within the United States, mm-hmm. uh, but sometimes the Lord will call us outside the country. So we'll we'll include that as well: different countries, um, different states, different cities across the nation. Yeah, and so in our sh- compared to others, probably short time in ministry, but yeah. yet still a rather lengthy time. So I've been in it almost fifteen years now. Mm-hmm. You've been in it probably what ten years, ten eleven years, something like that. Yeah, full time evangelism eight years. Okay, and then two years of yeah. Okay, was was the beginning. So, so ten years in ministry. Well, yeah. we'll say that in in the ten years, fifteen years, I have had the wonderful privilege of visiting hundreds. Yeah, probably hundreds of churches. Yeah you start to notice a pattern mm-hmm. when you go into these churches. And you know you've seen it. I've seen it, yep. You go to the churches, and, if you, and, and I'm going to use this as an example. Again, not to be disrespectful, but just to be very clear, very transparent. You go into these churches, you stand in the back, face the stage or face the, the rostrum area where the preacher's preaching, where everyone's looking, again, singing, praising God, listening to the preacher. Yeah. Just stand in the back and take a survey of your church. <laughs> I have done this at hundreds of churches. Yeah. And you start to see an overwhelming clear pattern. And again, not to be disrespectful, but this is exactly what I've seen vast majority of the time. And when I say vast majority, if I if I had to put a percentage to it, I would say anywhere from 98 to 98.5% of the time. Okay. You stand in the back and you see whitehead, 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 three year old. <laughs> whitehead, 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 seven year old. Whitehead, 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 ten year old. Whitehead, 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 baby. Whitehead, 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 twelve year old. 
Whitehead, Whitehead. So again, not again, not trying to be disrespectful or critical in any manner, but yet that's the reality of our no, churches. I got you, bro. Yeah. When you look out in the majority, I'm yep. not saying that all. I'm not throwing all churches under the bus here. Yep, I'm not no. saying this is the exact experience in every single church, mm-hmm. but in most churches today, the vast majority of the <laughs> overall uh, uh, demographics, I guess you could say, of ages of age groups. When you start looking at that statistics, and I have some statistics here. They're a little dated uh, because I haven't been able to find any like recent statistics in the past probably two or three years. Mm -hmm. But but the most recent statistics that I was able to find show that more than 85% of the churches in North America, North America, Mm -hmm. the median age of that 85% is anywhere from 60 to 80 or 60 and above. Yeah, and that's what I've experienced. So that means now yeah. that the fifteen percent, you go mm-hmm. in and you start looking at the age groups among the remaining fifteen percent, mm-hmm. and you start to get into yeah. even more interesting graphics. The or not graphics, the demographics and the age groups, uh, statistics. The point I'm getting at is, we are drastically missing the age groups from about seventeen to thirty five. Yeah. 17 to 35 are almost non-existent in our church as a whole. That's a problem. Now, when you look even more into the statistics, the most recent statistics I was able to find, for every 10 people we went into the church, four are leaving. Now, it's easy for someone to look at those statistics and go, okay, well, that's that's not great, but it's also not horrible because that means we're retaining the majority, yeah. right? If, 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 yeah. I, if I go and I win 10 people and only four are leaving, that means I'm, I'm retaining 60%. Woo! Hallelujah. Yeah. But what's interesting is when you go into that 40% that's leaving, mm-hmm. statistics are showing, the data is showing, that of the 40% that's leaving the church, the vast majority, and some have even uh, estimated more than 90%, of the 40% that are leaving the church are between the ages of 17 and 35. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so when we, we talk ha- about youth, we're not necessarily just talking about only like the little the, kids, the, the little kids or, the, or the teenagers. We're talking about young adults. We're talking about young adults. All the way up to yeah. ages 35. Yeah. And, and, and again, I'm not even saying that above that, you know, there's not an issue. And, and uh, you know, there may be, in m- many cases, we're still missing a large percentage of 36 years old, 37 year olds, 38 years old, yeah. 39 year olds. Um, but usually when you start to hit that 40 years old and older, you start to see the numbers being retained a little better, mm. especially when you get up in the 50s and 60s. No disrespect. Mom and dad, grandma and grandpa, they're, they're, they're sticking it out. Mm-hmm. Where's the kids? Yeah. Where's the younger millennials? Especially especially the, the newer generations that you would say, which would be the Gen Z the younger generation. Millennial, the younger millennials and the, Gen Zs yeah, the, are nowhere to be found. They seem to be leaving almost as soon as they reach their adulthood and never returning. Or if they do return, it's very, you know, like it's Christmas or it's Easter. Or it's some kind yeah. of special holiday to make mom and dad happy. Yeah. Um, and, and that, that's, that's a tragedy. That's a cultural it's a tragedy. thing. Yeah. It's, it's just within our culture that that's how they respond because there's multiple <clears throat> factors, which we'll get into, but you had asked me about that euthanasia, um, mm-hmm. sermon. Yeah. I, I made that sermon cause I started looking into the stats and I was just yeah. overwhelmed. Like, oh my goodness. And, and this is truthfully, this is a truthful statement. I don't know when Jesus is coming back. Mm-hmm. I believe it's soon, but what, what I consider to be soon may yeah. not be his soon. That's right. Because we know for him, it's like, it's not even soon. It's just, I mean, for him, it's just, <laughs> he, he's going to come back very, and then it's going to be over, right? Yeah. Uh, but from our perspective, we keep saying it's soon, it's soon, it's soon. But that soon could be 20 years. It could be 30 years. It could be 40 years. It could be 100 years. We don't know yeah, we have exactly no when, he, but we know it's soon based on yeah. the prophetic timeline. But if I would say this. If Jesus doesn't come back within the next 20 to 25 years, we're going to have a major, major issue going on in the church. Mm. Because the issue at hand is going to be, well, I mean, is there a church left to have? Based on a lot of, of the, the numbers leaving, and based on a lot of the churches that I've visited and been around, and 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 this isn't every church, but these are a lot of. I would say the, at least seventy five percent of the churches that I've been to in the in the ten, in ten years, really, it would be a miracle if some of those churches lasted 
beyond 10 years. Mm -hmm. And and that's just based on the fact that a lot of the leadership and the people that's kind of keeping that that boat afloat, so to speak. And it's not that we do it only. I mean, we know that God ultimately is the one who can, you know, turn a mess into a message, a test into a testimony, and a trial into a triumph. We know that. But God uses us to work for his people. God uses us to reach his people. God uses us to preach the gospel. God uses us as a light to reach the community. And if you go back to the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 2 to chapter 3, you read about the seven churches of Asia Minor that that you know God gives this amazing message to each church, right? Mm-hmm. And one of the things that he said in, in and he says this to he says this he says a lot of things, a lot of rebuke, you know, which rebuke is not an ugly word. It's just a word right. that means correction. God is trying to correct us. And he even says in Revelation chapter three, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Right. Therefore be zealous and repent. So rebuke and we're 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 gonna be doing some rebuking in this in this podcast. Straight now we're gonna be doing some rebuking in this episode. Things we've seen, things we've yeah. experienced and the church um that that is detrimental, extremely detrimental to maintaining our youth and mm-hmm. maintaining not just the youth, but the youth is the future. Mm-hmm. And if you don't, if your church doesn't have a future, you might as well close the doors. That's I right. mean, you're just playing church. You're That's just right. going through the motions. You just become a, a social club, right? A, a vacuous praise club, if you will. Right. I mean, come on. And so if, if there is not a youth, youthful presence there within the next, you know, 10 years, I would say, for some churches that, that start to take over leadership as some of these members are getting older to the point where they're going to be dying off, then yeah, these a lot of these churches are going to be closing a lot sooner, and that's a tragedy, right? Because mm-hmm. But what I was saying, though, going back to Revelation, is that Jesus says to one of those churches of Asia Minor, he says to them, repent, or else I will remove your candlestick mm. out of its place. That's right. Now, what was the candlestick? A symbol of. There was a seven-branch candlestick there in Revelation. Mm -hmm. That was a symbol. The candlestick was a symbol of the seven churches. So he's saying, if you don't repent, I will snuff out your light. I will not use you as a light. And and I think that in some places and areas, there has been an un... There, let, me, let me say it this way, because I don't want to be unkind, but I want to be true at the same time. Sure, no, be, be, be very the, transparent, transparent. There has been an unwillingness yeah. to to con- conform and to change and be willing to change and get out of the rut that a lot of churches have been stuck in for years. Mm-hmm. And because of there, there's not there's not willing they're, they're not willing to change. And it's not like you you change the you know uh, the content. You don't change the content of their message. You don't change mm-hmm. the content of the Word of God. You know, we don't we don't believe in adding or taking away from the Word of God. But we, me and you, have been in situations and worked with churches where we we want them to change. We right. we're, we're we're telling them as the youth of the church, like, look, guys, we're gonna we're gonna set this church on fire. We're gonna do some amazing things. But right. you guys got to work with us because if we're bringing people in and we're winning people to this church and we're doing all this amazing you know stuff and and you guys aren't willing to change and you're just gonna run off everyone mm-hmm. that we bring in with a lot of your ways that are not working and that haven't proved to work. And that's why nobody new has come into the faith. Nobody new has been one to the church. Nobody new has been discipled in. And essentially, this is this is an ongoing problem, right? We've mm-hmm. had this ongoing problem for a long time. And so we're going to get into some stuff. Mm. We're going to talk about it. Absolutely. So tell me, what what has been... I know I asked this question earlier. I'm going to ask it again because I know you had to kind of set the stage. We had to open up with prayer. What has been for you, if you were, and I know it's hard to put it in order. I know yeah. it's hard for you to put it in order. It's hard yeah. for me to put it in order, too. But I don't really know that there is an order, because I'll be like, like you yeah. said, and you've, you've already brought out that some of these people have responded. We've looked at some of these comments, yes. and the a huge per- percentage of them, they're all spot on. We're just like, yeah. yep, yep, check, 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 yep. that's right, yep, check, that's right, Yep. because everyone has a different experience. But uh-huh. Finish what you were going to say. Yeah, so, so for you, what has been, through your experience— the number one thing that you believe is causing an exodus of the youth and young adults mm-hmm. in the church today. Can I answer it by reading a quote? Go for it. Okay. Go for it. I, I, Absolutely. I, I, I could try to paraphrase this quote, okay. and, and, and I think I would get close, but this quote, when I read this a few years ago, and actually I had read it multiple times, and it's amazing how this happens. You'll read something multiple times, and never catch the power of it until somebody else finds it and reads it back to you. Mm, and mm, that's what happened. Okay. You, you, you shared this quote with me and reminded me of this, even uh, though I had read it a I'm, couple of times. I know what quote you're sharing. And, yeah. and you read it to me one day, and I was like, bro. <laughs> I was like, 
Dude, I've read over that so many times in my studies and my readings and my devotionals. But this quote has kind of, again, not that it's all-inclusive, but certainly covers a large span of the issues of yeah. why I believe okay. um, that many youth today are struggling to have a connection with church and have an interest in spiritual things. Okay. So this this quote is coming from, I'm going to adjust my mic here so I can read this and still be in the mic. Um, this quote is coming from Desire of Ages, page 309. So the book Desire of Ages, page 309. Now listen to this quote very carefully. It's a little lengthy, but okay. listen very carefully to the words because... This hits the nail on the head, in my opinion. Mm, I Not agree. the only reason, but it certainly covers a lot. Yes. So this is what it says. The greatest deception of the human mind in Christ's day was that a mere assent to the truth mm. constitutes righteousness. Mm. Because I believe in it, because it's there, mm. and I subscribe to it. I recognize it as true. And I'm righteous, right? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. In all human experience, a theoretical knowledge of the truth has been proved to be insufficient for the saving of the soul. Mm. It does not bring forth the fruits of righteousness. Notice yep. that word fruits. Mm -hmm. We're going to come back to that. A zealous regard for what is termed theological truth often accompanies a hatred of genuine truth as made manifest in the life. Mm -hmm. The darkest chapters of earth's history are burdened with the record of crimes committed by bigoted religionists. Mm. The Pharisees claimed to be the children of Abraham and boasted of their possession of the oracles of God. Well, you've got the truth. Yet these advantages did not preserve them from selfishness, mm. malignity, greed for gain, and the basest hypocrisy. They thought themselves, tell me if this sounds familiar, they thought themselves the greatest religionists of the world. But their so-called orthodoxy led them to crucify the Lord of glory. Mm. Now here comes, the, here comes the, the home run, right here. The same danger still exists. Many take it for granted that they are Christians simply because they subscribe to certain theological tenets. In other words, again, back to, we just believe it because this is truth, and because we believe it, we're holy people. Yeah. But they have not brought the truth into practical life. They have not believed it and loved it, therefore they have not received, here's the key word, the power mm. and grace that come through sanctification of the truth. Yep. And then this right here, tweet this, quote it on Facebook, Post it on Instagram as a text, as a, as a reel, as a, as a story, whatever it is you want to do. Here's the key one. Men may profess faith in the truth, but if it does not make them mm. sincere, kind, mm. patient, yep. forbearing, heavenly minded, it is a curse. What's a curse? The mm. truth. The truth can be a curse. It is a curse to its possessors, and through their influence, it is a curse to the world. So let's mm. nail this, let's put this down. Let's nail it. You ask me, what is what do I see to be one of the major issues that is causing youth today to not so be interested in spiritual things? Amen. To to not be interested in in, in being involved in the church. Yep. I believe that there is a spirit of uh, a Pharisaical spirit. Mm of people who think that just simply because they believe a few truths, yeah. that they're righteous and therefore they've become the policemen in the church Ooh. to make sure everyone else uh -oh. around them uh -oh. is righteous and living up to that as well. The policemen. And it leads to a great divide because... These people that think this, that are self-deceived, that are mm. actually, according to this quote, a curse to anyone that they're trying to influence yeah. because of their pharisaical spirit, because they think their righteousness is, is gold when really it's filthy rags. I believe these people have become a major, major negative influence mm. to the youth, and they've given them a bad taste about who Christ is and what the true gospel is. Amen. Amen. This bump right there, bro. Totally understand, bro. 100% agree with everything that you just said in that quote. And I think that, again, 
this idea of the ascent to the truth, yeah. this ascent to understanding, ha- having an understanding of the theological, you know, doctrinal right. evidences of Scripture, people people tend to take that and they think that that does constitute as righteousness. I've learned the this much of the Bible, and so I'm a holy man. I'm a holy mm-hmm. woman now, and I I think that's one of the greatest problems that many of the legalists have specifically in our church, people that are focused more on behavior, focused more on, look at what I've done, mm-hmm. look at what I've accomplished, right? Mm-hmm. And if, if you remember the story of the publican, and, this, and, and, and the, um, it was the story of the publican and, and the, um, the, Pharisee. the Pharisee that shows up. The Pharisee goes and he starts saying in the, in the parable that Jesus told, Lord, I'm so thankful that I'm not like this man. Mm-hmm. And then he starts listing all the things that he does, yeah. that he's done, right? Yeah. I tithe. You know, and I I give tithe of all that I possess, and I fast twice in the week, and I do this, and I do this, and I do that, and then Jesus switches to the to the the, the yeah. sinner, and he beats upon his chest, doesn't even so much lift his eyes up to mm-hmm. heaven, and he says, Lord, have, Lord mercy. have mercy on me, a sinner, a sinner, yeah. Humility. And Jesus says, verily, verily, I say unto you, the the latter goes to his house justified than the other, and I'm just like, mm-hmm. whoa, man, like. But this is the mindset so many people have. They think because they've accomplished so much, or they have a PhD, or they have a doctorate in theology, or whatever, that they've they've attained, they've arrived. Mm-hmm. And the same goes for even average church members who spend a lot yeah. of time reading the Bible. So for someone with this mentality, that's that's um, potentially negatively influencing or negatively addressing or causing someone to feel um, disconnected from the church and the church experience. Uh, to the point that it makes a young person want to say, you know what, I'm I'm not good enough. Mm-hmm. Apparently, I've made all these mistakes. I never say what's right. I never do what's right. Yep. I, I I haven't adjusted my yep. mind or my experience to the fullness of the truth, according to these people who have the truth. What is a solution to this type of mentality? This this Pharisaical, uh, you know, policeman mentality of I've got the truth. Yeah. Now you listen to what I have to say and and, and formulate your life accordingly. Yeah. Well. For me, in my personal life, and you know, they say people can argue with your theology, but they can't debunk your your personal testimony. That's right. This was my personal testimony because I've been through those Pharisaical, you know, legalistic views in the past. Right. Mm-hmm. I, I used to praise myself for all of the good that I did and all of the bad that I did not do. Yeah. I that would used to be me, and uh, and so I speak from experience. Um, I say confession is is good for the soul, but hard on the reputation, right? And that used to be me, unfortunately. So I can relate to those people that are are stuck up in that rut of legalism. Mm-hmm. I can I can relate because I've been there. Yeah, I have. But too. I think the solution is for me. How it worked was that I, I got tired. <laughs> you ever get tired, Ryan? Mm. I got yeah. tired of trying so hard to live like Christ, only to keep having failure in my life. Mm-hmm. And because I thought my misunderstanding, I had a big misunderstanding of sanctification, which is, you know, what does it mean to be, you know, to, to basically to be holy, to be like yeah. Christ. And and that is that was something I was misunderstanding. And and many people that's caught up in those legalistic views that are they mean well, but they're they're trying to get people to live right. They're trying to encourage people by their good works to live right. But that's not the proper motivation for mm-hmm. true life of repentance. Mm-hmm. In fact, the, the Bible tells us how we are to have true repentance. In fact, in, it's in Romans chapter 2 and verse 4, and, and I'm just going to turn there because this passage has meant so much to me over the years, more than the average person would be able to, to really know, especially that doesn't know me. Mm-hmm. Uh, Romans 2 and verse 4, uh, would you like to read that? Yeah, Romans chapter 2 and verse 4 says, Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? It's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. When you're focused on your goodness, mm-hmm. right? That was what I was doing. But I was focusing on my young goodness. Young man, is that cheese on your plate? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Don't you know what the spirit of prophecy says about cheese? Don't you know? Don't you know that your body's the temple of the Holy Spirit? And oh, you're going to Starbucks. Don't you know what the spirit <laughs> of prophecy says about about coffee and tea? It's like we know that yeah. there's a time and a place for yeah. this truth in one's life, mm-hmm. and that we should live the healthiest lives we can. I'm using this as an example, mm-hmm. but what we're expressing here is yeah. there's some people that feel 
like they have to police people. They yeah. they, they take well, Isaiah fifty eight one and they misapply and they misuse that. You know, uh, cry aloud, spare not, show my people their sins. Yeah, yeah, show the house of Jacob their sins. Tell right? them, yeah, yeah. Tell them about and, it. And the idea is that again, Jesus didn't have to go around telling everybody how wrong they were. Right. Like you don't see Jesus doing that. He doesn't go around and being like, look, you're a whore. You're a drunkard, and you need to all need to change. Like Jesus, don't do that, right? And and in a sense, like this is what Isaiah was doing in Isaiah chapter five. If you go yeah. read Isaiah chapter five, he was saying, "Woe to you drunkards, and woe to you, uh, you know, um, you harlots, and and woe to you, you know, despisers, and 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 uh, you know." I mean, he was going down the list, bro. He was he was he was saying woe to everybody. Mm -hmm. He was woeing everybody mm -hmm. up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the chapter of woe. <laughs> the woe. Go read Isaiah chapter five. Check it out. <laughs> He's letting everybody know how many, how much problems and it they makes had. Makes you want to say to him, "Whoa, yeah, whoa, yeah." But <laughs> what happened was God gave him His own woe. In Isaiah chapter six, he sees the Lord. No, absolutely. When he and saw God's righteousness. When he saw God, and 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 he saw the glory of God. Mm -hmm. He didn't say, "Whoa, all you people, look, you know what righteousness." No, he said, "Woe is me." I am undone. Mm -hmm. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people Humility. of unclean lips. Humility. He saw his own, and, and here's the thing. You don't see him saying, woe is me, any other time until he saw God. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the problem. When our focus is on our works, we tend to think we're good, we're mm -hmm. righteous. But for me, yeah. what happened with me is I started realizing, like, man, I got to have victory over sin. We know we have to have victory over sin. You read passages like what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, 48, be ye therefore perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. You see that the, the calling that God has put upon us is a high mm -hmm. calling. Yeah. And I'm wanting to have victory, but what I got, I got tired of trying so hard myself. So yeah. for me, how it worked, I started realizing that I forgot the reason that I started was not because I was so good, is that I realized that I wasn't good. Mm -hmm. I realized that I needed Jesus in my life. I needed a relationship with him daily, a, a daily walk with Christ. So you could say this. You could say that I knew the rules, but I didn't know the ruler. Yeah. I knew the doctrines, but I didn't know the doctor. Yeah. And I knew the word of God, but I did not know the God of the word. Mm -hmm. That was my problem. And I think for a lot of legalists and a lot of yeah. people, that's their problem. They yeah. haven't been reading the Bible for the purpose of getting to know the God of the Bible. Right. The Pharisees knew the word of God. Yeah. And they thought that their 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 subscription to or their their belief in those truths, those yes. oracles of God, yes. accounted for their righteousness. Uh -huh. And therefore, they thought that because they were righteous in and of their own works and of their own efforts and their own knowledge, they thought that now they became that, that standard, those police to everyone mm. else. And ultimately, I see this as being an issue of we have a bunch of people in the church who they believe a lot of good stuff. Oh, here, get this one. They they know the truth. Yep. The Bible. Yep. They know the truth. They do not know the truth. Mm. Yeah. It's one thing to know on paper or in theory or in ideology what the Bible says. Yeah. The truth. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and, and, and to subscribe to it, but mm -hmm. to not really know the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus Christ. And so when you know Christ, the Holy Spirit's going to be working in mm. your life. And what are the evidences that the Holy Spirit is working in one's life? Right here. Galatians, fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit. Galatians yeah. chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. It says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Mm. You're going to, in your interactions, in your sharing, in your witnessing, in all of the instances which you are interacting with others in the church, especially the young people yeah. whom are growing, who are learning, they're in those early stages. They're still trying to figure out who they are in Christ. They're they're they're, they're unperfect just like you are, yeah. but they're, they're very much still in those early growth stages. And sometimes we want them to take a big giant leap from where they are to where we are. Yep. Well, they just need to. They just need to to to, to, to get get right to, to to get right with the Lord and 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 just start doing better. You know, start start believing right and 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 doing better. And mm -hmm. and so it, it make this mentality of hurry up and get and get holy. 
Mm -hmm. Jump on the holy bandwagon. Yeah. When they're in the early stages, they're growing, and they're not where you are yet. And uh, again, we're not talking about compromising truth. We're not talking mm -hmm. about laying down, you know, oh, I know what the Word of God says over here, but, well, we're going to go ahead and let them defile that, or we're going to go ahead and let them mess that up, or we're going to go ahead and just turn a blind eye. No, 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 that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about being patient. What's yeah. one of the... What's one of the Fruits of the Spirit, mm -hmm. long-suffering, patience. Yeah. When we have the love of Christ in our life, we will experience the peace, the long-suffering, yes. the kindness, the joy, the goodness, the faithfulness, the self-control. Uh, and I think that that should, this should uh, boil over into our interactions and our relationships with everyone, especially Amen. the young people. Amen. And let me add to that. I think that what a lot of people do, what I was doing when I was caught up in legalism, is that I was I was focusing on the fruit of the Spirit— and not focusing on having the Spirit. Mm. Because again, you, you, if you focus on the fruit of the Spirit, and you're trying to have the fruit, it's called the fruit of the Spirit. Right. Because you, the only way you have the fruit is you got to have the Spirit. Right. <laughs> I mean, that's the... But I was focusing on the actions, the behavior. I was looking at all of the fruit as behavior. Yeah. And so I was trying to be like God on my own. But what's, what's amazing is some, and, some people in the church say, well, I go and tell these young people the things I tell them, because I love them. <laughs> I just, I love them. And then the love of yeah. God that I have for them. And as many as I love, <laughs> I rebuke and chase it. <laughs> no disrespect, <laughs> but seriously, I've had people yeah. tell me this. No, like, I well, you. you know, I, I let them know these things and I tell them the truth because I love them. Yeah. I, mm, I mean, you, you, I mean well, I'm not you, saying. You, you, can, you can tell people the truth and love them. <laughs> right. But but when you there's ways to share the truth with people, and but we gotta remember we're not the Holy Spirit, right? Absolutely, and that's what people they forget. They think that every time you see someone doing something wrong, that your job is to correct that. Mm -hmm. That's not our job. Mm -hmm. You don't see Jesus giving that that job to his disciples. And I think specifically in our church, this is more of an issue that, that we think that if somebody's doing something wrong, our job, our calling in life is to rebuke that brother, rebuke that sister, and correct them about the wrong that they're doing. That's and there's, not and our there's job. A, and there's a time and place for that when it's needed in the yeah. proper way, well, in well, the proper the manner. It's different if that brother or sister actually doesn't know. Right. But you're talking about stuff that, like, there's some of the stuff that people rebuke other people about. It's stuff that, that they, they know— they just aren't surrendered to God yet on that, or maybe they just haven't come, fallen in love with Jesus yet, and that's really mm -hmm. the, where, where, it draws the, where you draw the line. Yeah. If, if that person's not living the life that they know they need to live, it's, it's ultimately because they're not in love with Jesus the way they should be in love with Jesus. Right. And the only way you fall in love with Jesus is to spend time with him, mm -hmm. right? There's probably more time that's been given to the worldly things, and, and, and being they're being jaded by the things of the world than they are spending time in the Bible and spending time in the Word of God to fall in love with God. And so essentially that that's the issue. That's the problem mm -hmm. I think that many people are having in this legalistic views. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So let, let's also talk about another aspect, and that is it's easy to look in the church and say, well, you know, there's issues within the church, within the laity, but what about what about in the home? Is there any home factors that oh, come absolutely. into play for some young people who are just disconnect from spiritual things, disconnect from the church that ultimately leads them to leave the church and to say, this isn't for me. Mm, yeah. Well, you know, I, I think of a testimony of a brother that um, we both know. I'm not going to mention names because I don't even know if this brother would want me to share this. But mm. long story short, he was raised in a very legalistic home. His parents meant well. But I remember when he told his testimony, he said that, you know, his parents, like every time he went to the grocery store, he wanted to have like what he saw other kids having, right? Mm. He wanted to be able to, you know, play, you know, video games and, and, and experience some of these things. But his parents would always respond to him like, no, that's a sin. No, mm -hmm. that's a sin. No, that's a sin. He wanted a candy bar at the checkout counter. No, that's a sin. You know, everything became a sin. No, I got you. And it got to the point where th this, this young man, he, he got older. Right, mm -hmm. and and as he was as he was interacting with some of his neighbors and playing with some of the kids in, in, there, some of the neighbors were telling him, like this isn't bro like you you haven't lived like mm -hmm. you haven't experienced some of these things that that we've experienced like your parents must hate you, and so when he turned eighteen he left the house, you know he wanted to experience the world for himself because his parents wasn't balanced in their upbringing of him, and he went to the grocery store and I'll never forget what he said he said I, I bit into that Snickers candy bar. That I never, I always seen other other kids eating, and I never got a chance to eat. And when I bit into that Snickers candy bar, he said, "I, I only came to one conclusion: is that my parents hated me." Mm. 
And when he said that, like my heart oh my about goodness, melted. Bro. Like, but this is some parents they they overcompensate because they don't want their kids to be, they don't want their kids to be like the world. So they basically try to make them so heavenly bound that they end up not being any earthly good. Mm. That's a good point. And, and you can do that. You can get so heavenly bound to where you can't relate, you can't talk to anybody, to sit and talk with the tax collectors. Mm-hmm. To sit and talk with a sinner is like, you know, that's forbidden. And mm-hmm. that's exactly what the scribes and the Pharisees were experiencing with Jesus. Right. When he sat down and talked to these guys, they're like, what are you doing? Like, what is your master doing? He's sitting and eating and talking with the tax collectors and sinners. This is the kind of company he keeps. And, and essentially, I think that in the home... If we have a balance of you leading by example as a parent, as a, as a, as a leadership in your home, uh, as an you know, older brother, older sister, however that might be for you. And that's how I, you know, that's how I came into mm-hmm. even believing that God, I was 14 years mm-hmm. old. I believed that God wasn't even real. I was starting to believe that God, was, God must be some fable you know, mm-hmm. to make people feel good after they die. But when I saw you change, Ryan, that, that changed everything for me because yeah. I, I grew up with you. I knew you. We fought. We cussed each other out. We had loogie competitions and spit each other's face. I mean, we went through it, but I seen you change, yeah. and that was what was convincing to me. God must be real mm-hmm. because my brother's been reading his All Bible. Right, on that point, on that point, let's just go to the other yeah. side of the spectrum because you talked about those kids or those, those youth mm-hmm. – that are being raised in a home maybe of legalism where the parents are super oppressive with religion. Mm. Like everything is just, you got to walk a tight line, and if you're not perfect and you don't read this and don't read that and watch this and don't watch that and read your Bible every day and read your spirit of prophecy and do it. Like some people are raised in that very legalistic, mm. oppressive atmosphere that absolutely when they get older, they have absolutely no interest in spiritual things because it's been they basically they have been spiritually waterboarded with mm-hmm. religion. Yeah. Okay, so there's that aspect. Yep. We could see the fruits of why someone may reach that point where they decide the church isn't for me. There's nothing yeah. the church has nothing for me because I've tasted it, I've seen what it has to offer yeah. and it's oppressive and I don't want anything. That's that's negative. What about the other side of the spectrum? Mm. Those kids that their parents take them to church their parents ask them and plead for them to come to church, you know. But inside the home, the kids are seeing maybe hypocrisy. That's right. Maybe they're not seeing a spiritual a, a spiritual parenting. Mm. They're not seeing spiritual parents. They're not seeing yeah. a spiritual dad, a spiritual mom, someone who really loves Jesus and mm. is striving to be uh, not in a works approach, but maybe, uh, you know, has a sense of, of dedicatedness, committedness to God. Mm. So you have the flip side of that, there's which a lack of there's a lack of spirituality yeah. in the home, and it, they grow up with this idea where Jesus is a fairy tale to them. Yeah. Religion is just kind of a thing that yeah. it's not real. You know, the love of yeah. God's Sa- not real. The, Sal- the gospel's not real. Yeah, salvation is just as simple as you saying a prayer, and you live how you want to live. Living for Jesus isn't really, you know, doesn't demand any sacrifice, mm-hmm. doesn't demand any any life change. It's just a profession of life, you know. It's just mm. a profession of words, um, and yeah, yeah. I think that's a big problem as well. I really do. I think that there's there's a lot of people that are caught up in in that aspect of life, and they really believe that that they really believe that they can make it to the to the kingdom of heaven without having a sacrificial experience in a relationship that's with them and Jesus on a daily basis. They right. think that. They've said some prayer and they're going north, you mm-hmm. know, when 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 that role is called up yonder. And and I think that just goes to show a a negligent spirit that is is not really spending time with God and his right. word. Because Jesus doesn't give us that ideology, not one bit throughout the sixty six books of God's word. That idea mm-hmm. is totally divorced of the revelation given to us in the word of God that we can make it to the kingdom of heaven and and be righteous without, you know. Uh, again, doing what is right. You know, that's right. the whole root word of righteous, you know, to do what is right. And, and yeah, you have to have the Spirit of God living in you. And this is what Jesus said, you know, um, abide in me in John chapter 15. And then he said, and I will abide in you. But that's conditional. Mm-hmm. Jesus doesn't abide in a soul that ignores him. Jesus will not abide in a temple that ignores him. Mm-hmm. There must be a relationship, a daily relationship. And this is where Luke 9, 23, you know, one of my favorite scriptures uh, comes in when it says, you know, if any man, Jesus says, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, mm-hmm. right? 
take up his cross right. daily, daily and follow me. And follow me. And taking up your cross is dying to self, meaning that it's not your will that needs to be done in your daily life, but God's will. You have to say, not my will be done, but God's will be done. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so in, in a situation, and I, and I know you kind of touched on that, but let's nail it down just here in a minute or two. In a situation where a young person may be in a home where the parents yeah. are maybe oppressing them with religion, oppressing them spiritually, as I said earlier, spiritually waterboarding them with with the Bible, uh, with external um, spiritual writings outside of the Bible, or just religion in general. You know, what do we do with that? Or on the flip side, parents that want their kids to be religious, want them to believe in God, want them to be involved in church, but yet, you know, they're, mm-hmm. they're not really that interested because they're not seeing a genuine experience of Christ and the love of Christ in their parents' lives. Mm. So their, their parents, in a sense, are a negative witness against them in that sense. So the, 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 the answer to that, as you said, is having a spirit-filled, genuine spirit-filled experience with Christ, making sure that you realize as a parent that there mm. is a responsibility on the parent side yeah. to make sure that you are a reflection of Christ and that you yeah. are you, the Holy Spirit is genuinely working in your life. Now understand, we've we've talked about not allowing your Christian experience to be a works approach experience, mm-hmm. uh, but at the same at the same time, there is something on our part we must do, and that's surrender. That's yeah. remain in a surrendered state, and that is make decisions sometimes that may be not so easy to make. Mm. And here's the thing, you won't surrender to somebody that you do not love, mm-hmm. and you can't love somebody that you do not know. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's that's the thing, that there's a lack of relationship on both ends. If you're mm-hmm. a legalist, you don't know the Lord, and if you're a liberalist, you don't know the Lord, because you wouldn't be one of those things, you wouldn't be in one of those categories unless you spent time with God on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. God corrects those errors. I've been a legalist, right? Mm-hmm. I cannot say that I've necessarily been a liberalist, Mm-hmm. thinking I'm just going to make it to heaven by you know just saying some prayer and that's it and not living my life for the Lord. I've never been that, but there are people that have that that those views and have those that mindset, but both are unbalanced and it both are just a reaction because you haven't spent time to know Jesus personally. Mm-hmm. And that's not something I mean it's not really a hard scenario yeah. for me that the the solution is pretty simple. You have to get alone with Jesus and you have to have him and if you're a parent and you have a child that's struggling, you're struggling with right. Maybe you don't know how to deal with your kid. Uh, your kid's being liberal or not wanting to really follow, you know, the ways and the rules of the house and all of those things. There, there has to be a way that you reach them. And the same way goes if your kid is is you know you're you're kind of pushing your kid to do everything. You have to ask yourself, you know, what does God do to us? Mm-hmm. God doesn't force us to do anything, mm-hmm. but neither does God. Neither does God just sit back and say, I don't care, do what you want to do. Like, no, God cares. But God is God is convicting. He's moving in our lives. He's changing our lives. But that's God's job. Mm-hmm. And I think that sometimes, not just parents, but but church members mm-hmm. can play the role of the Holy Spirit, can can intervene in people's lives in such a way that they give them such a negative experience to where whether they're struggling with liberalism or legalism, they're they're pushed further away from the church, further away from religion, further away from God, Mm -hmm. and they assume that what they've experienced at that church is how all Christianity is, Mm -hmm. or what they've experienced at their home is what Christianity is. I mean, I've met people like this, and my heart hurts for them because I know, like I've experienced some of those issues, and I know, like, man, you know, it's not like that. If you just come alone with Jesus, get alone with Jesus, and let him speak to your heart Mm -hmm. through his word. You know, this issue we're talking about, it... I was thinking of this passage here, Mark chapter 10, verses 13 to 16. As we're talking to this, it says, Then they brought the little children to him, that they might touch, that that he might touch them. But who prevented them? Mm, that's right. Who prevented the little children or the, the disciples? Youth? It was the leaders, the leaders church yeah. leaders, yeah. the disciples. Because it says here, But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. Mm. But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased and said to them, Let the little children come to me, and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And he took them up in his arms, he laid his hands on them, and blessed them. Mm. And 
Remember I told you about that book, Desire of Ages, earlier? Mm. There's another quote here. I love this. I just want to read this. This read is it. a powerful, check powerful, it out. It out. powerful gospel quote here that's very much in harmony with the Bible. It says, When Jesus told the disciples not to forbid the children to come to him, he was speaking to his followers in all ages, to offices of the church, mm-hmm. to ministers, yep. to helpers, and all Christians. Jesus is drawing the children, and he bids us suffer them to come, as if he would say they will come if you do not hinder them. Mm. And so we know that there are ways that we can, and and this is what baffles me, bro. Okay, I'm going to go on a little bit of a Ryan rant here. I know none of us are perfect. I'm not perfect. And I know I have made mistakes in my relationship with God and in my interactions with others. I know that there have been times that the way I've acted, some of the things I've said, has hindered or prevented others, Mm -hmm. maybe from coming to Christ or seeing the truth. Mm -hmm. I admit that, and I'm not proud of that. I've repented of that, and I've asked God to forgive me and to lead and guide me in my interactions. I've had to go on Facebook because, again, social media gets us in trouble. (laughs) Sometimes our interactions on social media, and guess who's also watching social media, by the way? Your children, the youth. And God. They're watching us all. They're watching you at home. They're watching me and you and how we're interacting with each other. And when they see us bickering and griping and arguing and and acting, and I'm just going to say this, acting a fool on social media. Yeah. They see that, and that's a turnoff for them because they're looking, wait a second. Mm. (laughs) These are the same people. (laughs) These are the same people that tell me that I should surrender to the love of Jesus, that I should just love Jesus and and, and come to church and and be a good follower of Christ. And and they see us act this way. Yeah. And it's an immediate turnoff to them because they say, wait a second, this is... This, this is not, you're telling me that Jesus, is, is this what Jesus is like? Like you? Because if that's what Jesus is like, then yeah. I don't want to be like you. I don't you. want any part, don't of, want any part it. of it. Yep. And so here's what ends up happening, and this is what really, really kind of just irks me, man. We go on we go online sometimes, and we have these arguments, and I know I've done this many times. I'll, I'll see someone post something, and I'll tell you, people in my church, if you're watching this, pay attention. And be humble for once in your life and listen to what I'm saying. I'm saying this from uh, from personal experience because I've messed up in this area so many times. And I've seen the bad fruit and the bad outcomes that it can happen because mm. I've made this mistake more times than I should have. Yep. Yep. We go on social media, someone's post or comment catches our attention. And we <laughs> can't help it because they've said something, oh, Lord Jesus They've said something that we disagree with. <laughs> and and, and ooh, we can't help it because ooh, now we've got to resp- we've got to respond and we've got to set them straight and we've got to let them know that what they're saying is false and, and rebuke them and correct them. And, and in what happens when you go on with that spirit, it's almost like a vulture just waiting to devour its prey like as soon as they see it. alcoholic with whiskey in front and, of them. And so I like to tell them, mm-hmm. you know, I have this picture that I've shown in some of my uh, presentations of a keyboard that's turned into an assault rifle. It's a computer <laughs> keyboard that's that, turned yeah. into a saw. I call yeah. it the the 1844, the uh, uh, Turbo Smack 2300. I don't know. I just <laughs> came up with a name. I came up with some special name for it. But but we we go on there and then and then in the process of what we think is correcting and 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 in positive spiritual rebuke, in the process we are turning away others. Mm with our bad spirit that's not motivated out of love and it's not motivated out of proper uh, proper correction. Because the proper thing to do would be to go privately and follow Matthew 18 counsel yeah. and immediately go on there and say, you know what, hey, brother, sister, I noticed yep. you posted this. Absolutely. Um, you know, privately, mm-hmm. because you're at fault with them, right? You have an issue with what they've yeah. said. It's your responsibility to go to them privately and say, hey, you know, I just, I want you to know I, 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 I disagree with this and here's why, or share your disagreement with them. But the problem is we, we look at the public post and our mentality is, well, this is social media. They're going to post it publicly, and I'm going to respond publicly. And what you do is you want, many people selfishly want that negative attention because they're in a public forum, and they want others to see the rebuke that they're handing out. And yeah. ultimately, it does more damage than it does good. That's right. And I've been in this so many times because I've, I've been the one doing the damage. I've been the one giving the smack talk. I've been the one. And then sometimes in my selfishness would walk away going, ah, yes, I, I straightened that person out. I told him the truth. I gave it to him good. Only down the road to realize that the Holy Spirit would come to me and convict me and say, yeah, you, you don't realize the damage you've done mm. and what you thought to be good 
You, you, you turned away so many other people and you showed your true colors. <sighs> now I got to go pray. Now I got to yeah. go repent. And I've had to many times go in a private forum then in the aftermath of that garbage that I went on and done. And I had to go in and personally uh, send a, pr a private message to that person I was arguing with and say, hey, I apologize. I, I should not mm. have spoken that way. I should not have said those things. I got worked up. Uh, I, I let my... My carnal nature, I apologize for yeah. that. I didn't mean to hurt you. I didn't mean to say anything. And so the, the real, what I'm saying here is our youth are, are pouring out of the church for various reasons. But one of the major reasons why they are so disinterested, because I have parents all the time and, and, and grandparents all the time write to me or call me or, or ask me. And they'll say, yeah. Ryan, I just can't seem to get my, my, my grandchild interested in spiritual things. Or I'll have a parent to write me or, or call me, Ryan, what do I do to, to, to get my, my kid to be interested in reading the Bible? Mm. Well, well, first of all, let's take some let's take some personal self inventory. Let's do some, as self, Paul said, self examination. Self -examination. Yep, self examination, and, and see if you're in the faith. See if there's yep. something you're doing to prevent. Examine something. yourself whether you are in the because faith. Because many times, yeah. nine times out of ten, that could be the case. Yep. So you do have these these external factors that very much can affect our kids. Yeah. Uh, and I, I'm Absolutely. I'm going I'm to give you an opportunity to respond to this, but I also would like to get into the direction of. Now we got to apply the personal factor of, you know what? Our youth do have a personal responsibility mm. to seek after God themselves. They cannot show up in the presence of God and say, well, Lord, you know, it wasn't my fault. <laughs> yeah, it yeah, was their there's... fault or their fault or their fault, or, or, or that this is the reason why I never came to you, because we cannot show up in God's presence and ever point the finger at yeah. someone else expecting to get in or expecting to gain his favor and it always be someone else's fault. So there is a personal responsibility <clears throat> on behalf of even the youth to, uh, and we know there's some environmental factors that distract them and keep yeah. them from wanting to be into spiritual I things. I do believe a person's environment can load the gun, but... You can also use your free will to either unload that gun, or you could use your free will to pull the trigger and either take out others or take out yourself. And I think in a lot of ways, that's what's transpiring. There is there is a struggle with people in the environment that they have, but that they, I do believe there is a lack of self-responsibility from a lot of the people. They don't want to believe that a lot of youth and a lot of people, this is not just youth, this is just human nature. We don't like it when someone says, well, listen, it's not just others, it's you too. We don't want to hear that. We don't want to hear <laughs> someone tell us that it's also us. But it's true. We do have to take responsibility for our own actions. And at the end of the day, if anyone doesn't make it to the kingdom of heaven, it's not going to be because they, it's not going to be because, you know, uh, they, they wanted to be there, but just couldn't be there. Mm -hmm. It's going to ultimately be because they did did not want to be there. If someone doesn't make it to the kingdom of heaven, that's the reason why they're it's gonna, they're not going to be there. It's because they didn't want to be there. They chose not to choose Jesus. They chose not to follow the conviction of the Holy Spirit that God is placing in their heart and mm -hmm. in their mind. Um, and and so therefore, I believe that I believe sincerely that there is a responsibility that we need to clarify and say, yeah, you know, youth, you you know, the Holy Spirit is going to show you what is right and what is wrong, and it's going to convict you, and we have his word clearly given to us, we may not always like it. There's mm -hmm. things I read in the Bible sometimes I still don't understand, mm -hmm. and I ask God, God, why did why is this in here? Mm -hmm. So I still struggle with that, I really do, with different passages. I don't have the answer for everything, and I would say mm -hmm. you probably would say the same. We don't have the answer for everything, but there is a lot of answers the word of God gives us, beautiful mm -hmm. answers, that, that's very clear, but what it boils down to is that we... We are too carnally minded. We have spent too much time in the world, too much time with the frivolous things of the world, and and allowed our minds to become completely corrupted by the carnality of the world to yeah. the point where we really just don't care anymore. And if anything, mm -hmm. a lot of youth can turn into agnostics. It causes it causes the with the distractions and the world the, yeah. the carnality and the worldliness yeah. and and all that the enemy has bogged the youth down with today. But but I, uh, it, it causes a, a sense of des desensitization to sin. Yes, yes, and that's the truth. And so yes, every youth, every person, young person, young adult in in the church and even outside of the church is going to have to sit before the judgment seat of Christ like every single one of us and they're going to have to, you know, they're going to they're going to be judged basically for for their actions, for their motives, not just actions but motives. Why you might have done everything right, 
You know, Paul says in the Bible, though I give my body to be burned. Mm -hmm. Now, why did he say that? It's because they were burning the Christians on the stake, mm -hmm. right, in his, in his day. If you were a Christian and they found you, they would burn you on the stake. Mm -hmm. He says, I can give my body to be burned, but if I have not love, it profits me nothing. Mm -hmm. And so, again, you could, you, could, you could try to even do the right things for the wrong reasons, and you're still going to be judged right for that. So we have to ultimately... We have to ultimately be willing to, to look at ourselves in an honest way and say, have I really been doing what's right? Mm -hmm. Have I really been living the right way? Have I even been trying? You know, uh, every year rolls around. I make these, these not necessarily resolutions, but I make these commitments to myself that I'm going to work out. I'm going to get big. I'm going to put on 20 pounds of muscle. I always say this, like I've been saying this the last like five years and I haven't. And at the end of the day, I realize why have I not done it? It's because I have allowed other things to take priority in my life. Mm. That's why I haven't done it. And and that's just me speaking. Everybody's got their own issues, but I do believe that you have to eventually own up to your 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 issues, accept those issues and say, "You know what? This is my problem, but it's my problem that I believe I have a God that's big enough to handle it. He's big enough mm -hmm. to solve that issue." And I, I really do believe that there is a lack of of um, responsibility, that we don't like to be responsible for our own problems, our own mistakes. Um, you know, our, our mom growing up, she used to she used to say this all the time, and and she's not with us anymore. We know she's she's sleeping in the grave, but she used to say all the time when we would make her really mad. She used to say, "You're gonna make me cuss." <laughs> she would say this. She, you remember mom saying, "You gonna make me cuss." You gonna make me cuss. Southern mama. <laughs> and, and so we would laugh, and of course we would respond. You know the yeah. biblical answer, but like, mom, we're not gonna make you cuss. Yeah, you will choose, you choose to cuss. cuss. You gonna make but, me cuss. But there is a there is a, a truth though to what she's saying that, that there is your environment can affect you in a negative right. way. And uh, let's just say the purpose of this program is not necessarily to draw all of the attention back onto the youth and say, well, youth, you know, wake up and just live what live right and just do right. Right. <laughs> because that's not what we're saying. We are we are trying to be fair. Youth has to take respons responsibility for their own actions. But let's talk about some more stuff, bro, that's been happening that we've seen in the church, real mm -hmm. situations we've seen that I think need to be addressed, need to be discussed. And if anyone's watching this program and saying, like, man, like... I want to hear some of these things talked about. We're probably about to talk about it. We're probably about to get into it. But I, I want to say that we have to do better as a church as a whole and as Christians as a whole if we really want people to be able to stay at church, youth especially to be in church. We got to do better. Mm -hmm. We haven't created the best environment, church environment. And so let's talk about some of this stuff. You know, I was reading some of the comments that, you know, from the post that you had made. Uh -huh. There was one particular person that had uh, really, really... Um, I, as I went through, I was going, yep, 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 yep. And um, I just want to read a few of these points here, and we can take, take them point by point, because I think he really, really brought mm -hmm. out a lot of really good points that I think yeah. uh, sums up a balanced perspective of why our youth are pouring out of the church and why we have this youth issue. I want to read this one here, which I thought was interesting. A lack of gospel-focused expository biblical preaching. Mm. And then... It goes on to say, it's interesting how young people flock to Christ-centered biblical preaching. Tell them what the Bible says, not what you think it says. Mm. Don't gloss over the uncomfortable passages. Wrestle with the text with them. Admit when a certain passage uh, requires faith. Yep. That's a big one. Oh, man. Uh, you know, youth are tired of hearing the same old, same old, same old, same old uh, doctrinal, and don't please do not take what I'm about to say. Oh, Ryan said doctrine's not important. Oh, we don't believe that. No, everyone, yeah. anyone who knows my ministry knows that I very much understand that doctrines are important and a part of the gospel experience and the gospel message. But some people become so doctrine emphasized or so doctrine saturated yep. because they believe, well, they share the pillars, pillars of our faith. It's the truth, and we need to proclaim these truths. Well, yes, but but when you become so super saturated on the do's, <clears throat> yep, that you ultimately, and it brings me back to the to, to what one preacher said. He said it's not about what you do; it's who you know, and who you know changes what you do. That's right. In other words, the emphasis is on first seek a relationship with Christ, get to yep. know the God of the Bible, and then the message of the Bible will follow. That's right. But many times we want to say. 
Take the truth. Take the truth. Take the truth. When in reality, again, it goes back to what I said earlier, these same people, were, many people receive the truth. They accept mm. it for what it is, yeah. but they don't know the truth. Yeah. They don't know the God of the truth. Yeah. And so, and, and that yeah. goes that goes back to motive. Preaching like, Christ-centered messages. Yes, that goes back to motive. It goes back to why are you reading the Bible? Mm-hmm. Why are you studying the Bible? Is it a chore? Mm-hmm. Is it like, well, I got to get up and do my chapter today, or else I'm sinning? Right. <laughs> you know, like, is it a chore? Right. Or is it a a privilege? Mm-hmm. And is it a joy? You mm-hmm. know, um, I I think early on when when um I started keeping the Sabbath holy according to the commandment. Early on when we started keeping the Sabbath holy, it ended up turning into a um, a situation where I couldn't wait for the Sabbath to end mm-hmm. so I could do what I want to do. Because I knew the Sabbath was God's day, but I, got, I couldn't wait for it to end so I could do what I want to do. And some people make the Sabbath a burden, right? They make these things a burden. We'll talk about this more later on, but what happened for me was that I was looking at the Sabbath as one of those things like, you know, I can't wait for it to be over with so I can do what I want to do because, I mean, it's God's day. I'm giving him what he wants, but when the Sabbath's over with, I can't wait. But what ended up happening is I watched this video, uh, and it showed these guys keeping the, you know, they were keeping the Sabbath, and then the Sabbath ended, they were all happy, and they started partying. And they started, mm-hmm. like, you know, playing games and buying stuff and, you know, all this stuff they wanted to do. And the, the video ended with a punchline. The punchline was, what if God acted like that after spending a day with you? Mm. And that hit me hard because... Essentially, your motive for keeping the Sabbath, your motive for obeying God, your motive for doing anything right can actually be perverted motives. And mm. Jesus Jesus talked about this. He said, in vain do they worship me. Yeah. Hold on, well, let's just stop there. Hold yeah. on a second. You mean to tell me, Jesus, we can worship you and worship you in vain? Like, our worship for you is not even accepted. It's pointless. It's pointless because of motive. Yeah. It's all because of it all goes yeah. back to motive. Yeah, I can and I see think that, that that's that's essential when we're talking about, you know, this subject that if if we want true change, it can't be fake. Right. The motive has to be yeah. real. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, that's one of the that's one of the things that this person addresses here which yes. I thought was so great. Uh let me see if I can find exactly where they address this issue. Uh it was it was it was very very uh um, Number 6. Is that number six? Yeah, lack of noticeable authenticity. Yes. Yeah. So a lack of noticeable authenticity. If there is something that repels young people the most is, and this is so true, fakeness. Fakeness. Man, This person said, man, oh man, do they run from that? And that's true. Don't we all, right? Mm. If we notice somebody's being fake and, and, and uh, not genuine. You just kind of turned off from that. Mm. Young people want to know that their fellow members are like them, and thus oftentimes is the deciding factor to them choosing to befriend someone or not. In other words, be real. Yep. Like be real, be real about your struggles, be real about what, you know, your journey and what it is you're going through. Stop trying to make others around you. Stop trying to put on this mask yeah. and make others around you feel like you're holier than thou or you're walking the straight and narrow and there is no negativity or no problem or no, uh, like there, you have no sin in your life. When in the, at the end yeah. of the day, we know we all struggle with something. We all are sinners. We all are in sinners. Need of a savior. That's right. Absolutely. And, and that goes from the greatest of ministers... Mm-hmm. In the church, mm-hmm. to the lowest of the low, absolutely. Who's just coming in? Who or who's even out outside of the church? Let's go all the way there. Who's even outside of the church? Who's living worldly lives? Like no, no the greatest of the greatest of sinners and the greatest of of the saints mm-hmm. still have mistakes in their absolutely. lives. Still have sin in their lives that they have to confess, that they have to repent of, and and that's where you know this judgmental spirit is so heavy in the church. Where you know one of the things that this guy brought up, and this was this was Pastor Daniel Garza who mentioned this, uh, one of my friends in ministry. Mm-hmm. He mentioned this, and he said um, number four was a lack of community fellowship. It's amazing, he says, how as human beings, much of the lifestyle choices that we make have to do with the people that we surround ourselves with, right? Mm, bro, everything like what that was. That's, that's like dead on. Yeah. Like I couldn't have said it better myself. So. Yeah. Lack of community fellowship. When I was a Bible worker training churches on how to grow, mm-hmm. like that was my job, train churches on how to grow, and I was giving Bible studies and bringing people into the church, 
I told the church, look, I'm not bringing people in if you guys are all going to run them out. Mm. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Like, I'm not going to have a job that's, like, pointless. Like, so I remember giving trainings and all this at the church, and one of the number one things I focused on when I was a Bible worker was I was training the churches on how to have fellowship, like, with one another. Mm. And it was like pulling teeth from a horse yeah. to try to get the churches to, to come together. Why do you think that is, though? Let, let's talk, and I'm going to tell you yeah. why. This is me, what you just said. We we don't want people to see our flaws. We don't want people to see our errors. We live in this introverted society, and I really believe this has a lot to do with it. We live in this introverted society where we don't want people to see our errors. We don't want people to see our flaws. We don't want people to see our mistakes because they might come in our home, right, when people knock on our doors. Like mm -hmm. there's a reason why we don't want to answer the door and we don't want to come to the door. It's not just because, you know, oh, we look bad or we have a zit on our face or whatever, right? No, it's because... Our house isn't clean. And what will they think of us? <laughs> oh, have mercy. What will they think of us? Like, right, right. everyone doesn't have messy houses every <laughs> once in a while, right? And, and oh, you know, and, and they might want to, uh, they might see, you know, things around the house that I'm struggling with. They might see that I'm struggling with eating something I shouldn't eat. I'm eating too much sugar. I'm eating too much of this. And they might judge me on that, right? So it's easier for people in Christianity and the church and the youth to be introverts now. And if you think about it, think, think back when we were kids introverts wasn't even a thing we talked about. Yeah. Like, what was an introvert? Yeah. Like, I don't remember that word yeah, like, even coming up to until, Not to say it like, didn't exist, it's just we didn't, yeah. you didn't, you, we didn't well, hear a lot about with that. With the youth. Yeah. Like, but now you hear youth discussing, are, are you an extrovert or are you an introvert? And the vast majority of them are introverts. Mm -hmm. Because we live in this society where, again, I'm scared for people to see who I really am because they might judge me. And that's the whole point of, like, social media has impacted this tremendously because we have to put a fake version of who we are out there. Mm. And and you struggle with this. If they see someone else that they think is prettier than them, right? Then they think they're less of a person because they see someone else post a beautiful picture. And it's like, well, hold on a second. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And so you might look at someone and think they're more good looking than you or whatever. You know, girls struggle with that a lot than someone else. And so it's just there's this idea of like, let me just stay within my own bubble. I don't even want to go outside. Like, I just want to, I just want to stay in my own bubble, and I don't want to make myself available, who I really am, available to other people mm -hmm. because of what they might think about me, how they might feel about me, how they might see my personal struggles. And I'm gonna be honest with you. There's a, there's a big issue with pastors in this ministry, leadership and mm. ministry. I've talked to certain ministry leaders, and they're like, you know, we want friends. Mm. I've talked to leaders and pastors and conference leadership, and they're like, we want friends, but... You know, it's interesting you mentioned that, because I, mm -hmm. I, I see mm -hmm. exactly what you're saying. I see, yeah. I see a lot of that. People disconnect from the church, disconnect from fellowship, disconnect yep. from, you know, uh, interconnectedness within the church. Mm -hmm. On the flip side, I also see a lot of clickiness. Oh, of course. Of course. The church, you go into just about any church today, and most churches have their cliques. Oh, every church and has so, their cliques. And so, you know, youth, youth pick up on this. Mm -hmm. They pick up on it's the like fact, high school oh, all those, over those again. people over there, you know, they've got their little thing going on. And Remember in high school, we had like the gothic emo, <laughs> and, and you had the jocks and the sports people <laughs> and the cheerleaders, and then you had, the, you know, they had the geeks and the nerds, and, and then you had, you know, the, the uh, all of the, uh, there was all of these different, you know, uh, people right you had the band squad yeah, yeah. and different yeah. people, and they're just depending <laughs> on what school you were at you were cool depending on what clique you fit in right and churches have that same thing and shame on us as a church for allowing such things to happen for yeah. allowing it to turn into a clicky worldly environment right. where i've had church members come to me at certain churches and say yeah yeah if you're not a part of the church school then you ain't nobody in this church mm, if you're not a part yeah. of this school you're not a part of the academy or you're not a part of that then you're a nobody in this church and 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 if you don't make yourself to be available to be a part of the academy mm -hmm. then you're like that's just how it is you're not a part of the clique you're not yeah. in the cool club yeah we've got to, like, you know really speak, speaking of solutions on this you know we've got to be more the ch we we have to, and, and when we say the church, it's not like you and I are pointing fingers like straight up church. I mean, we're a part of the church. Of course, we have to be a part of the. You and I have to be a part of, of the course. solution. Yeah. But I think we as a church, we have to become a part of the solution. Each and every one of yes. us, and that is creating more opportunities for connectiveness, but encouraging people to come together, encouraging activities, <clears throat> encouraging mission and and ministry opportunities. And here's the thing. Here's the thing. Bro. It doesn't mm. always have to be church mission related. Mm. Even though I said that, we need to create more activities and opportunities yeah. for church mission. But when we're talking about interconnectedness, getting the youth involved, it doesn't always have to be, well, this Sabbath, we're going to go out and we're going to hand out literature. 
How many young people are going to come join us? I love handing out literature. It's a major mm. part of our mission. It's a major, you know, the the, the coal porting ministry, powerful. It's an powerful. awesome ministry, yeah. But it doesn't, our, our getting together and creating an, uh, an, an, a, a, an a connectiveness and an involvedness within the church yeah. does not always have to be uh, a church or religious centeredness. It, it sometimes can be fun. Mm. It could be, hey, yeah. let's go bowling Hey, let's have a game night. Yep. Hey, let's come together and do some Christian well, worship karaoke. And, and this hey, is let's come. Issue. Let's create opportunities to be together and to yep. fellowship. And this is another issue. The reason why a lot of people can't come together and have those kind of fellowship times is because they think they're going to be judged by other Christians well, yeah. in the church that that believes everything's a sin. Yeah, of course. No, you, that, you can't play that. cornhole. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Because cornhole they're tossing the bean bags into the hole. Yeah. Mm, don't they because know what the corn, because of cornhole says is, about is, that? Is un godly competition. Have mercy. I know, bro. And I know. Like, and, and we know that there's unbalanced people like, in there and that they affect a yeah, lot of people. Of course. There, it, anything can become... I mean, me and you used to compete about who could throw a rock further when we were kids. I mean, you could <laughs> hey, turn anything I into can throw a competition. This, I bet I can throw this trash into the trash can better than you. Yeah, like we, we, would, we literally... You can compete about anything, but that has nothing to do with like coming together and having fun. Like right. fun isn't sin. Yeah. Like right, having fun isn't a sin. Yeah. But there's a culture that brought that in and I think like I'll give you a perfect example. I had a um I had a woman come to me at this particular church and she said to me, she said, Could you please explain to my my my, my kids how they shouldn't be playing basketball on Sabbath? Mm. And this yeah. is exactly what I said to her. I said, What's wrong with playing basketball on Sabbath? Yeah, and she was kind of shocked by my answer, you know, because right. I'm this, I'm this, I'm titled as this conservative. Yeah, because you're labeled. Everybody's labeled. Everybody's labeled. You're, right? You were labeled if conservative. You, yeah, yeah. When you left that conversation, you were immediately labeled I as was a liberal that's going to hell. Well, 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 this this person, <laughs> this person took it really well. Surprisingly, they took okay, it really okay, well. Okay, okay. Praise there the are Lord. balanced people. Praise <laughs> the Lord. But she she was concerned that by their her kids doing this, it was a dishonor to God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and they misunderstand a because lot of the of text information, because yeah. turn thy foot away from the. Sabbath, you know, to do thy holy pleasure on my, or do thy own pleasure on my holy day, right? And call the Sabbath a delight, you know. And and they yeah. they quote this like, see, you're not supposed to have any pleasure on the Lord's day. It's like, yeah. well, hold on, really? If you're even any so fun. much, even so much to the point where I've had people say you can't have sex on Sabbath. Yeah, like well, I've had the, I've had people tell me that. It's like, hold on, God created sex. He didn't yeah. say anywhere in His word. Oh, let me find this. He didn't say anywhere in here, <laughs> thou shalt not have sex with thy wife. On Saturday. What's interesting like that's not is that in flies there. in the face. The very first command he gave him was be fruitful and multiply. Yeah. And the very next day was Sabbath. I get, but <laughs> no. This is this is the point I'm talking about. Like it's this unbalanced culture that's in the church. So this lady, she she said this to me. She's like, Look, you know, can you explain this to my kids? And when I said that to her, yeah. like, what's wrong with playing basketball on Sabbath? She goes, oh, she goes, Because Pastor Day are she goes, Are you being serious right now? And I said, Yeah. And she says, What do you mean? And I said, Let me explain. I said, Who's to say that your kids can't make something that, you know, I said, there's nothing wrong with having fun on Sabbath. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. I said, but who's to say your kids can't turn that basketball game into something educational, also connected with Jesus? Like, yeah. maybe learn a new Bible character. Pick a new Bible character, like Abishag or something. I don't know. <laughs> Pick some, instead of playing horse, play Abishag. <laughs> You learn how to spell that, and you learn some Bible characters. Like, you know, you play, you, you, can, you can make it fun. Rather than make it, you know, like a, a burden. Somebody's going to take that. They're going to make a new game <laughs> called Abishag. Abishag, yeah. <laughs> Abishag. Go going to put some right. Abishag tonight. All right. So, yeah. So, you see my point. Like, Absolutely. This 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 kind of mindset that's creeping, it's been been in the church for a while, but that it's affecting our youth. And so, mm -hmm. the youth are sitting there saying, like, man, everything's a sin. Mm -hmm. Like, I can't do anything. Everything's a sin. And that turns them away, too, from the church and wanting to be a part of church and wanting to come to church because they feel like if they, you know, bring their basketball out and mm -hmm. dribble their basketball on Sabbath, someone's going to judge them and condemn them to hell mm -hmm. and tell yeah. them that, you know, this is wrong and you're dishonoring our God. And yeah. it's like, really? Yeah. Like, come on, guys. Yeah, come on. It, it, we, we, we've stopped. We, at that point, we've stopped becoming biblical, and we have created traditions that are totally dichotomous mm -hmm. from the Bible. Like, God didn't say you can't enjoy things on Sabbath. Yeah. Like, all these same Christians will say, hey, let's go do a you know, 16 mile hike on Sabbath. Well, yeah. that's more work than that's dribbling what, a basketball <laughs> and playing horse. Right, bro. But it's in nature. It's like, yeah, it's but you're, you're getting nature. one with nature. We're getting, we're getting fresh air. It's like, bro, and, like, and I just, we're going to hike up that mountain and sweat to death, but it's going to be with the Lord. Yeah. Like <laughs> <laughs> this is the stuff that drives me crazy. And I just like, 
we have to do better. We just got to do better. <laughs> as you know, a church. again, I'm not trying to make. I know we we me, me and Dakotas being ourselves, we giggle and laugh about stuff like this all the time. What's amazing is I know that even from this one program, there's going to be. And by the way, we encourage you guys to give comments. Give a, talk. Give drop some comments uh, in the comment section, which I know some of you will no matter what because you don't need to be mm. prompted. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Let us know your Good thoughts. Good or bad, whether yeah. you like it, whether you disagree, we want to hear from you. What do you think about these issues? What do you think about why the youth are are not being retained, why the youth retention is, is an issue today within the church? This is something we, we need to address. We we haven't been able to go through everything. We 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 probably This issue will probably come back up. We'll probably talk about this again and oh, some other topics of in the course. future. But there are multiple reasons, and we don't just want to bash we don't. I mean, I, I don't think that's what you and I were trying no, to do. Today. We're no. not trying to bash but, it. But you have to talk about these things because yes. they're dif- they are difficult sometimes to talk about. But we also want to be able to provide solutions. Well, and, and let me say this: you're absolutely right. But when people hear you talking about something that they don't think you should be talking about, well, it's like, well, maybe this isn't for you. Mm-hmm. Like you, you don't like what we're saying. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> sit down. And be quiet. But it's just amazing. Because maybe it's not for you. It's just the nature of the world we live in. I know there's some people that's going to watch this program, and and they're going to, you know, just by some of the things we're saying, they've already labeled us like, oh, well, I thought Brother Day was a conservative, wonderful he, man. And here, here's, here's he's, the thing, bro. He's 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 compromised. You I've know. always been <sighs> biblical-based Christian. Absolutely. If I've said anything Absolutely. at any point that's unbiblical, mm-hmm. where where— Again, like people making these laws that's not explicitly talked about in the scripture, you know. Again, the, those are things that that are going to run people away with your Pharisaical. It's like the Talmud and all of these other, you know, laws. You know, like they come to Jesus and they said, "How come you and your disciples aren't washing your hands like the tradition of the washing elders them is? Washing them pots and washing, cups yeah, and them hands, pitches and the cups and the hand." Yeah. And 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 <laughs> Jesus didn't say, "Oh, I'm so sorry that I offended thee." Oh, I'm, yeah. I am so sorry that I offended you. Oh, oh, probably break have, out the dawn. And let us not offend. Wash these pots and Let cups. us not offend. Have mercy. The traditions of the <laughs> elders. Oh, no, that's not what he... Literally, Jesus responded because what they were saying were traditions of men. That's right. He responded right. and he said, why do you transgress the commandment of God to keep your tradition? That's right. And today, I think if he was alive, he would say, why are you running away, my youngins? My mm, youth in my, the church. Oh, that's a, that's a southern term, that's my, right, youngins. my youngins. My why, youngins. Why are you running them away? Woo! Because you want to keep your traditions. That's right, man. That's I'm right. sorry, man, but that's the truth. It, and, folks, and this it's is irritating. this is an issue that are you can tell you can tell just by the passion and the the energy in which we're discussing this. Like this is this is we're passionate about this. I see this as a major, major, major issue that has yeah. to be addressed. Yeah. We we cannot continue moving forward with the mentality of, and I know a lot of people have this mentality. Remember I talked about the mm. 85%, and by the way, earlier when I said whitehead, 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 I wasn't talking about white people. You know, we're not talking about the color of their skin. We're talking about everyone of all colors, of all skin colors, of all skin tones. Well, you said hit. Yeah, we're talking white, about the color, of their, color of their hair. Obviously, older, elderly <laughs> people. And by the way, Praise God for our elderly Amen. people. Praise we, God we for that eighty-five percent that's holding strong to the faith and remaining Amen. grounded. We're we're by no means trying to to throw yeah. our elderly. We respect our elders. We praise God for for that eighty-five percent. The the you know the the elderly people that are remaining grounded well, in the church. Well, if we had a bunch of but, youth come into the church and we had a lack of elderly people, we'd be doing we would do the same. We'd be doing that. yeah, like we're the yeah. old folk. We, 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 <laughs> no, no 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 disrespect, but we're, we're the old folk. We we got to get some some elderly up in here. We're missing them. Yeah. But the point we're getting at is this we the 85 percent the majority we cannot keep moving forward with the mentality of well at the end of the day these young people just they need to be not distracted Mm. they need to get right with god Mm. they need to put the cell phones down they need to stop watching television they it's easy to to look externally and say well this is their problem this is their problem this and yes we've talked about and we're going to talk more about this in the future because we're going to do stuff on social media we're going to do stuff on you know the on media like you know hollywood and we're going to get into other future topics where clearly it's a major distraction dilemma in in, in today's time we'll do a whole one on legalism and liberalism and some of this stuff and go deeper but I think that a lot of this culture has affected our youth. Mm-hmm. A lot of this, 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 these, these opposing polarized views in the church is confusing people, mm-hmm. and it's it's created an environment that isn't healthy. And yeah, this we, is this the is first. Th- about. Th- these young people, young millennials, Gen Zs, and this new alpha generation that's coming up—they're the first generations that are rising up, and they're they're saying enough's enough. 
Mm. We're not just going to conform. Yep. You got to give us a reason to conform. You got to show us. And so it's time for us to step up to the plate and say, okay, Mm. let's introduce them to the real Jesus. Yeah. Let's show them that it's not about religion, but it's about a relationship with Christ. It's about knowing God. There you go. It's about being the best example that we can be and being real and authentic and, and being open and transparent and being able to talk about things. Sometimes it's not easy to talk about. And also, here's a big one, being able to say these few words, four words, here it is, being able to say these four words, I do not no. There you go. That has an that that has that's one of the big ones in the church today is that everyone wants to have an answer for everything and sometimes you don't have an answer but yet you act like you have the answer and mm-hmm. you don't. That's right. There's nothing wrong with being humble and saying, "You know what? I don't know." Yeah. But here follow that up with, "But I'm not going to just lay down and not do something about it. I'm mm. going to seek until we have an answer for that. That's right. And so, folks, well, we've come to the end of this podcast, but I, I just want to encourage you, pray for <clears throat> our youth, uh, but also pray for everyone else. P- pray for our youth. Pray for everyone. Pray for yourselves, because there's responsibility on both parts. Yes. Yep. But me- much of what we've talked about today... It's time to do some self-examination. It's time to say, okay, Lord, what can I do? What am I doing that that, that can improve the chances of our youth, my young people, our young people, to stay in the church? And let me just add this as we close. Speaking specifically to the leadership of the churches around America, the churches around the world, from, from my experience, the reason why there's no change happening in a lot of these churches is because we're not willing to talk about... The, the, the struggles and talk about these issues and the leadership, specifically the pastors, which it starts with a lot of the pastors and, and the leadership there, they are unwilling to get up behind the pulpit and talk openly about these things. And because if you're, if you, a lot of people know the issues of the church, right? A lot of people know the issues of their local church. But if everyone's talking about it behind the closed doors, then nothing's going to be dealt with to solve that issue. And what we want is a solution. We want to bring a solution. Mm -hmm. Well, Jesus, we know, has the solution. But until we first admit we have a problem, right, we're not going to want a solution. And that's where I disagree with a lot of my brothers and sisters in leadership when they say, oh, well, the pulpit is not the place for that. The pulpit is not. well, Well, tell me, when else can you get all the hens in the hen house? When else can you get all the hens in the hen house? I don't see it happening any other time but on Sabbath morning. I don't see that happening on any other time because a lot of people only want to show up on Sabbath morning to worship services. And how are we going to get the attention of everyone and be able to get everybody down? Let's just let's just look at ourselves and examine ourselves and see that we all got problems. We all are sinners. Mm-hmm. Leadership has sinned. Membership has sinned. Just like the world is, is sinners. We all need to get come together and say, Lord... Forgive us of our sins. Cleanse us of our unrighteousness. And God, help us all together to come to you in prayer like they did in that upper room and pray for your Holy Spirit to change us from the inside out. Mm -hmm. That's what it's going to take. Absolutely. United prayer in Jesus Christ. Absolutely. All right, guys. Thank you so much for joining us today here on Day by Day Podcast. Drop your comments below. Tell us what you think about the com or the the content we've talked about today. The youth retention in the church. Give us your thoughts on what you think needs to be done. What you believe. Uh, maybe if there's something we missed today. Maybe we didn't have time to talk about and something. We didn't get into. Everything. We didn't get into everything there, for there's, sure. There's, there's a whole a lot, lot more we could have discussed. But drop some comments. Give us that like button. Give us a thumbs up. And uh, we'll see you right. We'll see you next week. Right back here on Day by Day.